a really, really striking difference for me was when it was time, the number of kids, uh, on the other hand, because when I lived there, it was 100 kids. Mm -hmm. So when I visited uh, in 93, they were down to 35 kids, and they could barely feed those kids. I was there around lunchtime, I remember going into the kitchen, and I I just couldn't even believe that they were serving. And and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like beans and potato chips or rice and potato chips or something like that that it wasn't really a meal yeah and it really struck me to you know to think that i had everything i needed when i lived there sure and so i I didn't know how orphanages worked i really didn't know that the government wasn't funding it um i didn't know any of that so i started to ask a lot of questions and i i figured you know i wanted to help when i found out that the orphanage has survived 100% through the generosity of, of individuals and organizations. That's when I decided I, I've got to do something to help. Were you working full time when you went I down was. there? I was working full time, um, and I had been working for the company for about five years. Uh-huh. I was. Um, I hadn't told anybody about my background. I had not mentioned anything. I was learning a new language. I was in a professional capacity in this company. And so I was really trying to um, learn as much as I could, assimilate, do my job the best I could. And I really didn't want to have anybody feel sorry for me sure, uh, because of my background. Uh, but coming back and, and deciding that I wanted to do something to help, I knew that it was going to be important to tell people my story mm-hmm. as a way to for them to understand why I really wanted to help this orphanage and and really it was the biggest blessing uh, for me you know my my closest community at the time was my work community the Uh people that I work with the owners of the company that I work for and um, they all decided to help right away every one of them said yes Wow. every one of them Wow and it started with you know let's sponsor each child twenty five thirty dollars um, and then everybody, we, we, as a community, we started to really talk about, well, what, what else can we do to fundraise? Let's do raffles. Let's do that. So we started to do different things with that uh, support of that community that, you know, eventually turned into larger fundraising and the need to, to um, uh, formalize the foundation. Hmm. So th- this foundation essentially started with your the company that you were working yes. for with, with the support of your work mm-hmm. colleagues and mm-hmm. owners. Yes, definitely. Pretty amazing. So at what point did you realize that this was a full-time deal and you needed to leave your, you know, your corporate it was, life? It was really always a f- pretty much a full-time deal Yeah. in that I still kept my, you know, obviously I had a, a role and a job and my kids were young and we were putting them through school and all of that. Um, but the foundation was always in the same building. Mm-hmm. as where I was. So we had a, a corner for the foundation, a couple of cubicles. And so it was always between my work and the things that I needed to do and, and the foundation um, evenings, you know, doing the foundation evenings on weekends. Um, it was it was a full time. I'm, I'm really um, blessed that my husband was able to help with the kids, you know, on, and on evenings and the weekends when I wasn't there. Um, over the years, but about six years ago, I was able to um, be full time yeah. with uh, Corazon de Vida. What an incredible commitment from your employer at the time, too. You know, to think about that. You know, here's an employee that came to you and said, "Hey, this is my past, mm-hmm. and I want to try to help." I mean, that to me, that sounds incredible. I I don't know at some point in my life if I would have been that open to saying, "Yeah, sure, let's do this." You know, that with yes. cubicles in the corner sounds like a major commitment <laughs> from them. It was definitely a major commitment. And one of the things that I've learned throughout the years, and and this is what I share with uh, every one of our volunteers, is that, you know, everyone is looking for some way of making a difference. We all want to have purpose in our lives. We really do. And for a lot of people, they can do that through church, through um, other you know things that come up in their life that allows them to do that, but there's many of us that are don't really have anything that we can grab onto, mm-hmm. and I've always said that the best gift we can give people is to give them the opportunity to participate and to make a difference through Corazón de Vida or any other you know any other way. We've had so many people that you know we we talk to them about what we do and ask them to join us. 
and you know after they've experienced supporting the kids and meeting the kids um, and, and having that feeling of you know having made a difference they tell us how much their life has changed and what a gift it was for them so sure. we always you know rather than be concerned or embarrassed like I was initially to to tell my story I learned that by telling my story I was really opening up the an opportunity for people to find purpose in life yeah and that's been really beautiful I mean I've, for over the years we've been around for 24 years we've had so many people tell us hey you know I I participated with Corazón de Vida when I was in high school or in college and I'm now working for a nonprofit, and that was really what what um caused me to even look at, at nonprofits and uh, it's just a lot of different stories of people where their lives have really been touched and changed because of the opportunity to participate. Yeah, we're really on the receiving end of that. You know, we, we feel good that we're donating, but mm -hmm. we're the ones that are benefiting mm -hmm. from that donation because we do. We, it enriches our lives, I, I think. So um, how long did it take? You know, you, you revisited where you grew up at and you knew you needed to help. How long did it take you to get that location to a place where you felt good about it and and they were on the road to, you know, re I don't want to say recovery, but they were on that right path for you to go, okay, I feel good about yeah. this. So it took us about seven years. Wow. Seven years of fundraising for uh, one orphanage. And at the same time, you know, we, we found a, a great partner couple that na are now the directors um, of that orphanage and that have been for the last 24, 25 years, and that's DJ and Lynette. You've probably met them. Mm -hmm. And um, they were just kids when they started. Uh, but having that partnership really worked because we could start to do all the fundraising in the U.S. They um, could run the orphanage and have the financial accountability that we needed for our donors. And, and that worked out really well, and that they started to build their network as well directly supporting the orphanage so as they brought in more support we were able to cut down on how much we needed to fund um, the orphanage and at that point we we realized we had the opportunity to expand to other orphanages and then we we started with two and then we added another and you know today we have um, 10 orphanages that we support so you also provide the tools it sounds like to these orphanages or these leaders down there to learn how to be a little bit self-sustainable, how to raise some of their own money and and not rely 100% on your donations at some point. Yes, we, we try to do that as much as possible. Um, work with them with special projects that can help them uh, raise their own money. I think one of the important things is to really look at each orphanage and their um, abilities and capabilities mm -hmm. um, closely when it comes to you know sel safe self-sustaining projects like you know doing a farm for instance one of the orphanages that we support in Valle de Guadalupe has a big farm and they I they're able to s to raise some money from that um, we've had other um, other projects in other orphanages and uh, it it works as long as the orphanage is prepared to to do that and has the personnel to support it mm -hmm. um, we really encourage them to reach out to other groups and other organizations and uh, and bring in support from others so that Corazon de Vida is not 100% of their support. Uh, God forbid something would happen to us and we wouldn't want to cause the same problem that had uh, my orphanage in the beginning, you know, lose all their support and, and uh, sure. be close to shut, shutting down. Sure. So um, you mentioned you're working with 10 orphanages now. Is, is that kind of your your standard max is 10 orphanages, no more, because, um, you know, it gets challenging to have more than that, or is there a significance behind that? Um, the significance behind that is the what we can do f as far as monthly support, and we really want to make sure that whatever orphanage we're supporting, that they have what they need to um, – to provide for the kids and not have to worry about whether they're going to be able to pay their bills the next month or feed the kids the, the next month. And the main reason for that is that we're looking at this um, from the perspective of long-term mm -hmm. support and, and actually being able to break that cycle of poverty and abandonment in Baja. And for us, the way to do that is to provide support and education to the children uh, that are in the orphanages 
to a point where they can become um, self-sufficient and able to provide for their own families in the future and be able to support the community. So aside from supporting the orphanages monthly, we, um, we have our continuing education program and that program puts kids through college and technical school yeah. that are, you know, the same kids that are coming out of these orphanages. Um, we've had probably about 60, 65 kids go through that, pr uh, that process. 45 um, are currently in the program, 45 to 50 that are currently in college, mm -hmm. university, local colleges and universities in Baja, in their own communities where they can be uh, professionals in their own backyards, in a sense, and give back to that community. Sure. Um, eventually, so we we have uh, about 15 that have graduated already, yeah. uh, including you know doctors and dentists and um, psychologists and you name it. I met one of your graduates at the fundraiser in San Diego, and I just could tell that this was such a well-rounded individual that had been, you know, fostered and cared for, and just was so impressive. You know, spoke great English. I mean, like the whole bit. I was like, wow, you know, this is really, uh, you know, some wonderful work that you have done on the education side, too. And I yes. think a lot of times people miss that component. You know, they want to mm -hmm. give and feed, but there's, you know, like you said, the education on yeah. being sustainable yeah. on their own, yeah. too. Well, and, and it's a lot to do. I mean, for the first, what was it, 15, 17 years, we really focused only on providing funding to the orphanages, making sure that the kids were fed. We knew that the other part was important, but we did we just didn't have the funding. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was we got to a point where we started to see the same kids that we saw when they were four and five years old and now they're graduating from high school. And now, you know, we're looking at them and saying, Okay, what's gonna happen to them once they leave the orphanage? Yeah. At eighteen, they're free to leave. They're pretty much given their paperwork and and they're done, um, same as, as in the U.S. And so it was at that point that we, we decided we needed to take a deep of faith and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to find the funding to support these students. And we started uh, in the 2011-2012 school year with three students, mm -hmm. and now we're at uh, more than 60 p mm. students Very impressive. going through the program. Can we step back a little bit and talk about, um, you know, some of the needs of these orphanages? I, I think oftentimes we get wrapped up in, I've got something extra at my house, you know, maybe it's a bag of toys and some stuffed animals and maybe there's some clothes there. And I'm sure those things are great. But when I look at the list of true needs, we're talking about rice and beans, literally, mm -hmm. right? And, and cleaning supplies. Yes. I mean, th can you tell us what some of those biggest needs are and, and where those focuses are today? You know, for for most people, the easiest way, and this is the way George explains it all the time, the easiest way to think about it is think about your household and think about the things that you need. Everyday mundane things like, you know, dish soap and, and detergent and cleaning supplies and laundry supplies and toilet paper and uh, napkins, all of that an orphanage needs times you know, 20. Yeah. If, you, if you're, if you, whatever you use for a family of two or four, just multiply that times the number of kids in an orphanage. Yeah. And that's what they need. And the important thing about that when, when it comes to supplies and that those are the, usually the only things that Corazon de Vida will take, mm -hmm. um, just because there's a lot of other groups that do clothing and, and, uh, um, toys sometimes. And the kids, sometimes they have way too many toys and they really enjoy playing outdoors, playing yeah. with a soccer ball and, you know, playing with dirt and doing those things, and they don't do a whole lot with toys. Sure, gotcha. Really. Yeah. I, I know that a lot of people, they think kids and they think toys. That's the first thing they think about. But um, so we usually ask people to do, if they want to do something special for the kids, to do something personal, like clean uh, new underwear, socks, um, a new pair of shoes, uh -huh. you know, those kinds of things we, um, we usually go after. But definitely supplies and definitely food. You know, any anything like like you mentioned, you know, rice and beans, and uh, we ask for proteins, you know, like tuna and yeah. um, things like that that are non-perishable that that can last for. They can store in their while. pantry. Yeah. I you know I've I've seen so many lists of needs over the years. 
I can't say once I've seen cookies on that list or something that is a treat. And um, 